After the fall of the Roman Empire in the 5th century, there was something of a power vacuum in Europe. No monarchy rose to fill the space left. Instead, the Catholic Church began to grow in power and influence, eventually becoming the dominant power in Europe although this was not without struggle. Like the Romans they had their capital in Rome and they had their own emperor, the Pope. Fundamentally, the power of the Catholic Church stemmed from widespread belief. As the doctrine of Christianity became widespread and the accepted norm, the Church's status as an intermediary between God and the people, as well as the idea that clergy were the so-called gatekeepers to heaven, filled people with a combination of respect, awe and fear. 1. Well, the Catholic Church was extremely wealthy. Monetary donations were given by many levels of society, most commonly in the form of a tithe. The tax which normally saw people give roughly 10% of their earnings to the church. The church placed value on beautiful material possessions, believing art and beauty was for the glory of God. Churches were constructed by fine craftsmen and filled with precious objects to reflect the church's high status within society. This system was not without fault. Whilst greed was a sin, the church made sure to financially profit where possible. The sale of indulgences papers which promised absolution from sin yet to be committed and an easier route to heaven, proved increasingly controversial. Martin Luther later attacked the practice in his 95 Thesis. However, the Church also was one of the main distributors of charity at the time, giving alms to those in need and running basic hospitals, as well as temporarily housing travelers and providing places of shelter and sanctity. 2 education many clergy had some level of education, much of the literature produced at the time came from the church, and those who entered the clergy were offered the chance to learn to read and write, the rare opportunity in the agrarian society of the medieval period. Monasteries in particular often had schools attached, and monastic libraries were widely regarded as some of the best. Then as now, education was a key factor in the limited social mobility offered in medieval society. Those accepted into the monastic life also had a more stable, more privileged life than ordinary people. 3. Community by the turn of the millennia C1080 society was increasingly orientated around the church. Parishes were made up of village communities, and the church was a focal point in people's lives. Church going was a chance to see people, there would be celebrations organized on saints days and holy days were exempt from work. Power the church demanded that all accept its authority. Dissent was treated harshly, and non-Christian faced persecution, but increasingly sources suggest that many people did not blindly accept all church teachings. Monarchs were no exception to papal authority, and they were expected to communicate with and respect the Pope including monarchs of the day. The clergy swore allegiance to the Pope rather than to their king. Having the papacy on side during a dispute was important, during the Norman invasion of England. King Harold was excommunicated for supposedly going back on a holy pledge to support William of Normandy's invasion of England. The Norman invasion was blessed as a holy crusade by the papacy. Excommunication remained a sincere and worrying threat to monarchs of the time. As God's representative on earth, the Pope could prevent souls from entering heaven by casting them out of the Christian community. The very real fear of hell as often seen in doom paintings kept people in line with doctrine and ensured obedience to the church. The church could even mobilize Europe's most wealthy people to fight on their behalf. During the Crusades, Pope Urban II promised eternal salvation to those who fought in the name of the church in the Holy Land. 5. Church versus State The size, wealth and power of the church led to increasingly great corruption in the course of the Middle Ages. In response to this dissent arose eventually formed around a 16th century German priest Martin Luther. Luther's prominence brought together disparate groups opposed to the Church and led to the Reformation which saw a number of European states, particularly in the North, finally break away from the central authority of the Roman Church, although they remained zealously Christian. The dichotomy between Church and State remained and remains a point of contention, and by the late Middle Ages, there were increasing challenges to the Church's power. Martin Luther formally recognized the idea of the doctrine of two kingdoms, and Henry VIII was the first major monarch in Christendom to formally separate from the Catholic Church. Despite these changes in the balance of power, the Church retained authority and wealth across the world.
and the Catholic Church is believed to have well over one billion adherents in the modern world. The major gods of ancient Roman religion The three main Roman gods, known as the Capitoline Triad, are Jupiter, Juno and Minerva. The Capitoline Triad replaced the archaic Triad of Jupiter, Mars and earlier Roman god Quirinus, who originated in Sabine mythology. Venus otherwise called Aphrodite mother of the Roman people, Venus was the goddess of love, beauty, fertility, sex, desire and prosperity, equal to her Greek counterpart Aphrodite. She was also, however, goddess of victory and even prostitution, and patron of wine. Venus was born from the foam of the sea after Saturn castrated his father Uranus into it. Venus is said to have had two main lovers, Vulcan, her husband the god of fire, and Mars. Vulcan Hephaestus god of fire, volcanoes, metal work and the forge, maker of the weapons of the gods. In some mythology Vulcan is said to have been banished from the heavens as a child because of a physical defect. Hidden in the base of a volcano he learned his trade. When Vulcan built Juno, his mother, a trap as revenge for his banishment his father, Jupiter, offered him Venus as a wife, in exchange for Juno's freedom. It was said that Vulcan had a forge under Mount Etna, and that whenever his wife was unfaithful, the volcano became volatile. Because of his position as deity of destructive fire, Vulcan's temples were regularly located outside cities. The Enlightenment helped combat the excesses of the Church, that established science as a source of knowledge, and defended human rights against tyranny. It also gave us modern schooling, medicine, republics, representative democracy, and much more. So how did one movement inspire so much change? Here are the four most powerful ideas behind these revolutions, and how they reshaped our world forever. Separation of powers ever since the Greeks, debate raged as to the best form of government. But it was only during the Enlightenment that Europe really began to question traditional forms of authority. Baron de Montesquieu's seminal spirit of the laws 1748 admired and heavily quoted by the Founding Fathers, described the principle of good governance that would go on to shape modern politics. Montesquieu observed in England a rudimentary separation of powers, the executive the government of the king the legislature parliament and the judiciary the law courts. Each branch exercised power independent of one another, keeping each other in check. Reading of Voltaire's Lord Ellen de la Chine in the Salon of Madame Geoffrin, 1812 credit, and at Charles Gabriel Lemony. It was not a new idea, the Romans had enjoyed republican government but it was the first time it had emerged in the contemporary world. Progressives across Europe began to argue for a more rational and constitutional form of limited government which would separate the powers of executive, legislature, and judiciary. When the American colonies won their War of Independence in 1776, their government was the first to guarantee a separation of powers. By the mid-20th century, it had become the most popular form of government worldwide. Rights of man prior to the Enlightenment, the notion that all men had equal rights was rarely held. Hierarchy was so entrenched that any deviation from it was deemed dangerous. Any movement that threatened the war disputed this hierarchy, from John Wycliffe's Lollards to the German Peasants' Revolt, was crushed. Both church and state defended this status quo with theoretical justification such as the divine right of kings, which claimed that monarchs had a God-given right to rule implying that any challenge to this rule was against God. But in the 17th century, scholars such as Thomas Hobbes began to question this God-given legitimacy. Theories formed about the relationship between the state and their subjects. The state offered protection to its subjects, and in return they swore their loyalty. John Locke took this a step further, asserting that all men possessed inalienable rights from God that entitled them to life, liberty, and property what he called natural rights. If the state did not provide and protect these natural rights then the people had a right to withdraw their consent. The Enlightenment thinkers took Locke's ideas a step further. The Founding Fathers established the United States Constitution upon Locke's natural rights, expanding them to include the pursuit of happiness. Other Enlightenment thinkers, like Thomas Paine, made these rights more and more egalitarian. By the end of the 18th century, Declarations of the Rights of Man had made the full journey from theory to reality. France joined the United States in popular uprising. Although it would be another century before these concepts became more widespread, they could not have happened without the Enlightenment.
secularism the absolutism of the pre-modern world was based on two powers, the state, and the church. While kings could claim the loyalty of their subjects by force, the church usually buttressed these monarchies with theories that justified their hierarchy. God gave his power to kings, who commanded their subjects in his name. Disputes between the church and the state could disrupt this relationship, as Henry VIII's tumultuous divorce from Catholicism proved, but generally their mutual support was firm. The theorists of the Enlightenment exposed this relationship between sacred and profane power. Using the sectarian bloodshed of the 17th century as proof, they argued that states should not have any influence in religious affairs, and vice versa. The Treaty of Westphalia 1648 which ended the religiously motivated Thirty Years' War, created a precedent by asserting that states could not violate each other's sovereignty, even over spiritual matters. Religion stopped being a valid motive for foreign warfare and freedom of worship began to be accepted. Voltaire, one of the Enlightenment's most celebrated thinkers, was at the forefront of this debate. Like many of the era's thinkers, he was a deist, refuting the church as stranglehold of sacred. Instead, deism prized direct experience of the sublime through nature. For a deist, evidence of God was all around us in the splendor of natural phenomena, and you didn't need a priest to decipher it for you. By the end of the 18th century, the idea of a formal separation of church and state was coming to seem more and more inevitable. It paved the way to a future where fewer and fewer people would claim any kind of religion whatsoever. Materialism as science developed, an old question began to be asked with new urgency, what make living things different from non-living things? A century earlier, French philosopher René Descartes had sparked a new rationalist approach with his discourse on the method 1637. Portrait of René Descartes by France Halls, C1649-1700 Credit, Bouvier Museum. Over the course of the 17th and 18th centuries, that rationalism spread, providing the foundation for a materialistic view of man and the universe. New theories, such as Isaac Newton's groundbreaking concepts of gravity and thermodynamics, seemed to point toward the mechanistic understanding of life. Nature was like one big clockwork machine working in perfect unison. It supported both the new discoveries of natural philosophers like Newton, while also maintaining an important role for God. Inevitably, these ideas began to seep into the political and cultural discourse. If things were mechanically ordered, shouldn't society be as well? Rather than being animated by some ineffable spirit, perhaps man was driven by nothing more than a network of cogs. These questions are still debated today. Even among the radicals enlightenment. This was a fringe idea. Few thinkers fully divorced themselves from the concept of a creator. But the seed of materialism had been planted, and it eventually flowered in the mechanistic and godless theories of Marxism and fascism.